remarks. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'd like to yield myself such time as I may consume. The gentlewoman from Florida. I thank the Speaker. I rise in strong support of this important resolution, which honors, as the inscription at the Korean War Memorial reads, our sons and daughters who answered the call to defend a country they never knew and a people they never met. On a pre-dawn Sunday morning in June 1950, while the world slept and the church bells of Seoul had yet to ring, North Korea launched a sudden, unprovoked military strike on the Republic of Korea. President Harry Truman, when he received the news, immediately returned to Washington and summoned his cabinet. Within 48 hours, the president had directed General Douglas MacArthur to undertake a vigorous defense of South Korea and her people. The rest is history, history of what has come to be known as the Forgotten War. The conflict in Korea became the first test of the mettle of the West in confronting communist aggression in the Cold War. Over 50,000 of the boys and young men and women of the summer of 1950 who left for Korea did not return, including over 33,000 who fell in combat. In the sweltering heat of that summer, in the monsoon rains, on the windswept expanse of the Yalu River, and in the bloody withdrawal from the icy Chosen Reservoir the following winter, they gave, in some cases, their last full measure of devotion. Names like Heartbreak Ridge, Pork Chop Hill, Gloucester Valley, where British, Belgian, and Philippine troops joined with their American comrades in arms, echo down to us in the slowly fading memories of aging warriors. Were their great sacrifices worth the cost, worth the blood, sweat, and tears of the boys of summer of 1950? One only has to look at the faces of those living in freedom in South Korea. One only has to look at the gleaming towers of the bright skyline of Seoul in contrast to the darkness, the impoverishment, and the fear that lies north of the 38th parallel to say, thank God for those brave men and women who risked all to save so many from communist oppression. However, we were unable to help save them all. One need only reflect on the huddled refugees crossing the vastness of China on the underground Seoul train. One need think only of the young North Korean women escaping the hopelessness of sexual bondage in China for freedom in South Korea to know that those who answered Harry Truman's call truly made a difference. I was a proud, proud sponsor of the reauthorization of the North Korean Human Rights Act during this last Congress to help address some of those issues. Today, dark clouds hang once again over the Korean Peninsula, sadly. The vibrant economy and the flourishing democracy of a South Korea, which had risen from the ashes of war, is again under the threat of the tyrannical and belligerent North. In March, in a clear violation of the Armistice Agreement, North Korea launched another sudden, unprovoked attack, torpedoing a South Korean naval vessel and murdering 46 young South Korean sailors. And Pyongyang's provocation is not limited to military strikes. In actions which are clearly those of a state sponsor of terrorism, North Korea sent a hit squad of agents to Seoul to assassinate a leading dissident and attempted to ship weapons to via Bangkok to designated terrorist organizations Hamas and Hezbollah. Madam Speaker, now is the time for our president to show some of the mettle that, that defined our nation 60 years ago and stand up to the North Koreans by redesignating their country as a state sponsor of terrorism. Our South Korean, Japanese, and Israeli allies are depending on us to help shield them from the North Korean provocations and the weapons of mass destruction. In the crisis on the Korean Peninsula, Beijing has played a cynical game, calling 
for the Korean, Korean Peninsula to be denuclearized on one hand, and yet shielding its North Korean cronies on the other hand. Beijing even had the audacity to publicly warn South Korea not to let the aircraft carrier USS George Washington enter waters lying between the Korean Peninsula and China for a proposed joint U.S.-South Korean naval exercise. Well, we have news for Beijing. If you don't want the USS George Washington in your backyard, then you had better rein in the bullies in Pyongyang. Another sterling legacy of the Forgotten War is the vibrant Korean-American community. Immigrants from Korea over the past six decades have contributed immeasurably to the American mosaic, impacting positively this nation's economic, educational, scientific, and cultural life. Economic and trade ties have also boomed between our two countries in the decades since the war, ties which could be greatly invigorated by prompt congressional action on the proposed free trade agreement with South Korea. Thus, it is perfectly clear that the world is a better place because of the heroism in Korea of the Boys of Summer 60 years ago this month. The 60th anniversary of the outbreak of war in Korea is an appropriate time to demonstrate that we continue to stand with our South Korean allies. The people of South Korea should be assured that we stood with you in that summer of 1950. We stood with you during the recent uh, 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 crisis, and we shall stand with you until the day of peaceful reunification with your abused and besieged brethren in the North. Madam Speaker, I strongly and enthusiastically urge my colleagues to support this joint resolution. And with that, I reserve the balance of my time. The gentlewoman reserved the balance of her time. The gentlewoman